now turn to the fourth case on this morning's docket. Case number 119-148 in the matter of Rosie M. Quinn. Appearing on behalf of the Disciplinary Administrator's Office, Chief Justice Nassau, I request two minutes rebuttal. Two minutes is granted. Thank you. This is an original action in discipline. It arose out of Ms. Quinn's uh, 2011 convictions of seven counts of violating 26 U.S.C. 7202, which is the willful failure to pay employment taxes, a felony, and two counts of violating 26 U.S.C. 7203, which is the willful failure to pay income taxes. Those are misdemeanors. In November of 2011, Ms. Quinn was sentenced to 36 months in prison. Uh, those convictions were affirmed in 2014. <coughs> Excuse me. In November of 2017, we had a hearing panel on this matter, and at that time, the panel found a violation of KRPC 8.4b, committing criminal act that reversed, excuse me, that reflects adversely on a lawyer's fitness as a lawyer. Uh, the panel issued its report in March of 2018. At that time, it recommended a three-year suspension retroactive to the date of the October 2011 temporary suspension order. Um, the panel did not recommend a reinstatement hearing. No exceptions were filed with the panel hearing, so it's presumed the respondent admits the violation. So the only issue today is the appropriate sanction. At the hearing, our office recommended sort of an alternative discipline. One was an indefinite suspension that would have been retroactive to the date of the final hearing report, uh, excuse me, three years retroactive to the date of the final hearing report. So the final hearing report was March 26, 2018. So the retroactive would be three years prior to that or in the alternative, a one-year uh, one suspension with a reinstatement hearing that's retroactive to the date of hearing. I guess really what the point of this is to say is that what our office is recommending is that there be a suspension and that Ms. Quinn be able to apply immediately for reinstatement once this court issues its decision. In the it's matter. almost as if the, the hearing panel and what took place in front of the hearing panel was one, uh, a typical uh, hearing panel, but also a sort of reinstatement hearing in, in, in some respects because you took into account what had taken place over the last three or four years. It just seems to me you're satisfied with their current condition. Our office is not. I would agree that the panel found that um, without requiring a reinstatement hearing. I want to make it clear that the disciplinary administrator's office believes that a reinstatement hearing is necessary. And I'm going to explain okay. why, because I think there are some factors that are considered in reinstatement that were not considered in the disciplinary hearing. The purpose of the disciplinary hearing was, one, to determine if there was a rule violation, and then two, to determine the appropriate sanction. So first, with the court's um, permission, I'll just say that we believe that the presumed sanction in this case is suspension. If you look at the ABA standard, I believe it's 5.12. And it talks about suspension is appropriate when someone knowingly engages in criminal conduct that doesn't have the elements that are listed in 511, which were not in this case, and that seriously adversely reflects upon a lawyer's fitness. We'd argue that these seven felony convictions in this case really are serious convictions that satisfy the requirement of a presumed suspension. And I believe indefinite suspension. So then the question, and, and that's based upon um, Ms. Quinn does have some prior misconduct and the seriousness of the violations. So then the issue comes in, I think a question actually was asked earlier this week about when we do retroactive. Um, and here I think that's based upon the recommendation that this indefinite suspension be retroactive is based upon the mitigating evidence that was presented at the disciplinary hearing. 
And I believe that mitigating evidence is that she has not practiced law since 2009. Okay, so that's nine years. Uh, she presented some pretty compelling evidence that her misconduct was caused by a severe, serious, chronic gambling addiction. Uh, Ms. Quinn presented evidence that she has not gambled since 2009. Uh, she has paid a price. She went to federal prison for three years as a sanction for her criminal conduct. Prior to going to trial, Ms. Quinn paid back the money that was owed on the employment taxes. There was a restitution order in place for $70,000 that compromises the income taxes, and she has been making payment toward that restitution. She established significant remorse at the hearing. So those are the mitigating factors that we took into consideration when determining that this should be a retroactive sanction. When will the payments be completed if she's on a payment plan? I would have Ms. Quinn testify to that. It's going to be a while because I think the payments are uh, relatively small. I believe the hearing testimony was that she's making $25 a month payments. Okay. You said there were reasons, maybe this is where you're headed next, but you said there were reasons that you thought there were some issues that were unaddressed in the panel hearing that need to be addressed in a further reinstatement hearing. Correct. Is that where you're headed? Yes, that Thank is you. exactly where I'm heading. Thank you. We believe that a reinstatement hearing is necessary for three reasons. One, the first one I already mentioned, that Ms. Quinn has not practiced law since 2009. One of the issues to be cited on a reinstatement hearing is whether or not a respondent has the requisite legal knowledge to be practicing law. Nine years is a very long time. A lot changes in the law. Um, I do not believe Ms. Quinn has been doing any CLEs during that time period. So I think a reinstatement hearing would be necessary to get to that issue and see if she has the requisite legal knowledge. We do that with something far short of a reinstatement hearing in lots of other cases. When somebody, for example, wants to come back from inactive status, we have kind of a rule of thumb that if it's been 10 years, they need to take a bar review Sorry. course. Um, or if it's shorter than that, then they certainly have to be up on CLEs. Um, you think a reinstatement hearing really is called for in that? Just if I that were this, the only issue you would. It's ask not for, the only you? issue, but I do. You're right. The court could require as a condition that she take a bar review course um, instead of having to establish okay. what she's going to do to get. What, the what we could presume do she doesn't have the requisite legal knowledge, or the court could okay. and do these conditions. The second condition um, that is established in a reinstatement hearing, one of those factors is that, that a respondent has received adequate treatment and or rehabilitation. Um, this court is probably aware of the procedural history of this case, dealing with disability and active status. Um, and really up until the spring of 2017, Ms. Quinn was saying that she was not able emotionally or physically to resume to the practice of law. Um, this court removed her back to temporary suspended status because of failure to comply with an order to get um, an independent medical examination. Prior to the hearing, Ms. Quinn did produce a letter from her treating physician, Dr. Logan. That's, it, was, it was a short letter, a concise letter, and it's in the record, that basically said, I believe at this time she is emotionally able to return to the practice of law. I would argue that a, a reinstatement hearing probably would be better able to get to the heart of this. Um, we already talked about this chronic, serious addiction that to Ms. Quinn's credit, she has received some treatment for that. She has not gambled since 2009, but I would um, submit that probably not enough inquiry went into that at the disciplinary hearing to say, you know, what is the nature of the treatment? How often do you go to Gamblers Anonymous? Are you seeking Dr. Logan's, you know, do you go in once a month? She might be able to testify to that today, but that, that did not occur at the disciplinary hearing. There was some evidence of it, but because that wasn't the nature of the disciplinary hearing, I think to really delve into it, I, that's another reason why I believe the reinstatement hearing is necessary. And then the last reason, one of the standards it talks, or excuse me, factors it talks about for reinstatement is um, a respondent's compliance with prior orders of the court. And in the record, you will see that Ms. Quinn was disciplined by this court in 2008. And that dealt with um, some trust account problems. And I believe there's some evidence to indicate that her gambling addiction contributed to those. But that 2008 Supreme Court decision is sort of hanging out there still. Because at that time, the court suspended a one-year suspension, but, and I think it was for a period of three years, and said these conditions have to be met. Well, because of everything that sort of happened that resulted in the action that we're here today, that 
that's still sitting there. There's some conditions that Ms. Quinn has never met from this, this court's decision back in 2008. And I think that could also be addressed in the reinstatement hearing. So in summation, our recommendation today from the disciplinary administrator's office is that the appropriate sanction in this case is indefinite suspension, that it be made retroactive to whatever date this court sees fit that would allow Ms. Quinn to apply for immediate reinstatement and that we conduct a reinstatement hearing to address the factors that I just talked about before the court today and any other such additional relevant factors. You're willing, you're willing to go uh, straight to reinstatement hearing immediately after the decision is yes. put down? Okay. And given your experience, how long typically would it take if she applied the day after uh, our decision came out until the reinstatement hearing was held? Our office would make every effort to expedite that process. I think typically there's a, a petition that the respondent has to file and then we respond to it. Um, we would respond to it immediately saying we believe that enough time has passed and then we would you know, set the matter for hearing. So I would say, I mean, at the outset it could be six months, but I would say it could be done as quickly as three months. Any further questions? All right, thank you, Council. May I please the court? Just briefly, I'm not going to go through my whole life story. Um, I'm sure you may remember me from when I was here the last time, most of you. But in any event, just briefly, let me just go through something. I'm 62 years old. And as long as I can remember, I have lived with tremendous emotional pain. I'd always tried to mask my pain from others for various reasons. I developed what I perceived to be a tough exterior and I proceeded with my life. I was able to function in many respects as though I was normal, you know, whatever that means, but never really coming to terms with the source of my emotional pain and turmoil. And I never dealt head on with how my emotional pain was impacting my life. Now, nothing stopped the pain. Not my love of my family, not educational achievements, not being a lawyer, not making money, not anything. I spent a big part of my life just trying to cope and escape. Food and sex and shopping were good comforters for me, but no matter what I was doing in life with family or work or church, I could not separate from the emotional pain I felt until I was introduced to casino gambling and my blackjack tables. And what, and unfortunately for me, I was introduced to it within a few months after I was licensed to practice law uh, that was in Las Vegas. But there's a big difference between going to Las Vegas, you know, three or four times a year than having the casinos in your backyard where you could go every day. And that's what eventually happened to me when the casinos came to the Kansas City area in 1994. But I felt that gambling allowed me to completely escape. When I was gambling, I didn't think about anything else but gambling. 
But gambling was that band-aid, that coping mechanisms. My problems were far deeper than gambling. Gambling was just a response to the chronic depression that I had experienced as long as I could remember. Maybe not that phrase, but it was clear that that's what I was going through. But be that as it may, gambling became my God. I love the Lord. But gambling became my idol. It came before everything. It was more satisfying than anything I'd ever experienced in my life. Now, the healthcare professionals were, have told me, will likely tell everyone that I was suffering from a mental disease and defect. And I accept that. However, I will tell you that I believe that most everybody has some issues in their lives that they had to come to terms with. Nobody has a perfect life. And I blame myself for not dealing with my issues in a better way. But I will also tell you this, that if I could have stopped gambling, I would have stopped the gambling. That brings us to the loss of my job after I was indicted and conviction and incarceration. Now, I didn't stop gambling after I was indicted or lost my job. Matter of fact, I'm so interesting, I thought it would free up time for me to do what I like doing my gambling and possibly make, you know, make a living at it. But it finally came to me that gambling had almost succeeded in what I had been trying to do all my life, which was self-destruct. It had helped me do that. And I said, the only thing gambling can take from me that I haven't lost already is my life. And I thought that if I continued to gamble, I would die. That's what stopped me. I was driving late at night to casinos without sleep, without anything. And I knew that's the only thing else I had to lose was my life. And I suddenly realized that my life had some value. And that's probably a big part of this. I spent all of my life, woe is me, legitimate reasons, about the negative things that I'd experienced in my life when I should have been focusing on the blessings that I had. God granted me reasonable intelligence. I'm not the smartest person, I'm not the dumbest person, but I have reasonable intelligence. I should have been looking at that. I should have been looking at my family, all those blessings that I threw away with both hands because I was not strong enough to do what I needed to do to overcome this. Okay, charge would not pay on my taxes. I've explained to you that gambling was my God. It came before everything. You know, it wasn't, it was not just my taxes I wasn't paying. You name it, I wasn't paying it. But from my perspective, I thought taxes was just another obligation that I was not meeting. Another bill collector who had to stay in line with the rest of my bill collectors because gambling demanded my money. Gambling demanded everything, but so me not appreciating that not paying taxes was criminal or could be criminal, I didn't do anything about it. Now, I always admitted that I knew I had an obligation 
to pay my taxes. I really didn't appreciate it was criminal for various reasons. I'm a lawyer. I represented people in bankruptcy court. I filed uh, bankruptcies for people who discharged taxes that they had owed over 10, 10 years in court when other professionals, including lawyers, were discharging tens and hundreds of thousands of taxes in bankruptcy court. In court, seeing practicing professionals with a million dollars, I remember one time, of employment taxes. And some people say I should have known. And of course, I wish I had known, but I did not. And it simply goes to my lack of criminal intent. I would like to believe that if I'd known I could have been prosecuted, I would have done better, even notwithstanding the gallon. But be that as it may, I think I fully litigated all the issues I raised. I'm not going to go over it, but I fully litigated. I believe I raised various legal issues. And of course, we know the Court of Appeals decided against me. Writ of certiorari was denied, and so I'm a convicted felon. Now, keep it in mind that I always filed my taxes. I always told the truth. Nothing dishonest. My employees were not damaged because once your employer your files the appropriate work, which I did, the employees are protected. And of course, if I had not reported it, I would have been charged with embezzlement. But I just didn't pay my taxes. And, and, uh, and even though some people say it's willful, I was suffering from a tremendous force that took my money. But thank God. Thank God. We've gotten past that. Okay. Uh, unfortunately for me, I had to go through all of this to get to where I am. I would not or could not come to terms with the things that had been bothering me since I was a child. I would not or could not stop my gambling. So unfortunately for me, it took all of this to get me to deal with these issues. Unfortunately, because there are, there's always collateral damage. But I'm at that point. And one of the things I obviously did not appreciate was my law license. Because if I'd appreciated it more, I would have protected it better. Now, even though I have questioned in the past how, you know, my not paying taxes reflected upon my uh, legal profession. I know it did. It does. It has. Because if lawyers don't uphold the law, how do we expect other people to uphold the law? I feel bad about it. And even if other lawyers were not paying their taxes, I should have been paying my taxes. So, I am telling you all as humbly as I can that I would like to practice law again. Will I ever be able to practice at the level I was in the past? No. Uh, however, and by that I mean I have some physical issues. Let, let's talk about the path to re-entry as you okay. see it. One of the responsibilities that we have is not only ensuring that you know the discipline occurs to the lawyer appropriate with the misconduct, but the other part of it is to make sure that in letting you use your license to practice law that the, that the public is protected and, uh, and, and able to rely on the fact that you have a license. So. The, the, the big disagreement between the panel and the disciplinary administrator is you going through a reinstatement hearing in order to demonstrate that the rehabilitation is good, um, 
that um, there's been adequate treatment uh, and that your legal skills would be good enough. Do you object to going through the reinstatement hearing that the disciplinary administrator has proposed? I would prefer not to. However, it's whatever you all decide I will comply with. And the reason I object uh, to it is because the number of years that I did practice law. I practiced law for almost 30 years. That's the only thing I ever did as an adult. From age 25 to I think uh, I stopped a few days before I turned 55. Even though I have not been engaged in the practice of law like that, when I was in prison, I had to file my own appeal uh, with the Court of Appeals. Uh, and I have worked since I've gotten out of prison, when my health was permitting it uh, as a paralegal. So I haven't just really completely been out of the realm of the legal profession. What kind of uh, law firm was it there? Was General you doing practice. paralegal? General practice. Okay. Basically the same thing I did all the years when I practiced law. Where at? Uh, I work for uh, the McIntosh Law Firm in Kansas City, Kansas, uh, and then I've done paralegal work for Attorney Reginald Davis. Uh, those are the ones that I. Is that why not just? I mean, is, that, is it all located in Wyandotte County? Oh yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah, yes. And uh, so, uh, and then state uh, court or federal court or both. State court. <laughs> Can you speak to um, the second point that Ms. Moylan made? That was the receiving adequate treatment, what you're currently doing. Uh, just speak to what's happening there. For a number of years, I've been seeing psychiatrists. And almost exclusively, since I got out of prison in 2014, I was seeing Dr. William Logan, and he is the one who had done that evaluation, um, you know, during my criminal trial, and then he has written any letter that you all have received, uh, you know, for these procedures since then. And so I do have my psychiatrist. And, and your, your contact with him is? How frequent? Well, I just saw him uh, within the last uh, couple of weeks. Uh, but you have to understand, well, I'm encouraging you to understand that a lot of this is just me realizing what has happened, the consequences, and what my goal is for the future. Now, I'm not going to stand here and tell anyone that some of the same issues that have plagued me all my life uh, are not present because, you know, I suffer from depression. <laughs> and things will happen in your life that will trigger that. One of the great things I've had to deal with since I've been home, family members getting sick, family members dying. Forty and the, uh, since since I was here, I think the last time I was here in 2017, I just lost my sister. 
then my longtime companion was dying of cancer and he's died of cancer. And October 1st, I lost my 41 year old nephew to cancer. So things happen, life happens. And my problem in the past was not navigating certain things better. And I'm a better navigator, in my opinion. <laughs> I'm a better navigator. But I do go to see the psychiatrist. Uh, I go to see him on an as-needed basis, uh, and uh, he's helped me tremendously, and I've gotten benefit from going. Uh, but if a person is determined uh, to be self-destructive, they're going to be self-destructive. If a person wants to go out and gamble, they're going to go out and gamble. I choose not to self-destruct anymore, and I choose not to gamble anymore, and I choose not to be all of these negative things that people made me out to be anymore. I'm choosing life, and I'm choosing life more abundantly. Okay. My life has worth, my life has value, and I choose to live. So, I'm sorry, did I answer your question, yeah, you sir? Did. Okay. Do we have any other questions of counsel? Would you Me? like Would you like uh, 60 seconds to wrap up? Uh, uh, yeah, and, and then, um, I have no problems going to those CLEs. I have not gone to a CLE since 2009. Uh, and I think going to the CLEs would be more appropriate for me. But again, I just I, I would like to have my job back, and uh, and uh, I would do whatever you all uh, think uh, I should do. But I think after me doing those CLEs, I should be ready to go. And uh, I apologize to everyone for being a convicted felon <laughs> and going to prison. Uh, and uh, but that's not my entire life. Thank you. Thank you, Council. I don't have any further uh, statements or arguments. Mostly. I had one curiosity about the hearing panel report, and, and, it, and it weaves into your recommendation as well. And, um, it was the notion of the, that it's a mitigating factor that the misconduct was remote in time. And it seems weird that that would be a mitigating factor because, uh, you know, there, certainly there's 15 or so years, but this is the first shot that these allegations have actually been in front of this court because we had federal criminal actions and, and serving time and, and, and all of that. Is there, is there legitimacy, I guess, to mitigating for the misconduct when it takes so long to get here for those reasons, do you think? I mean, did you factor that in? Um. I actually would agree with the court's analysis. I'm not sure if I factored that in. Another attorney did it, but I, I would agree that you have to look at the conduct underlying the discipline from the, the, the prior discipline. I think the dates there, I don't have them in front of me right now, but um, in fact, I think there was even mention in the transcript of the hearing that some of the stuff that was going on that was uh, part of the prior discipline um, was going on at the same time that Ms. Quinn was having her troubles with paying the taxes to the IRS. So um, I think probably it might have been a short-sightedness um, in declaring that mitigation and looking at the date of when we're trying the case versus when the misconduct occurred. And for the same reason, I think it'd be hard to say it's mitigation to say, well, you know, nothing's happened since then. 
because the attorney is not And then practicing. one other question on the reinstatement uh, review that you're recommending, would practice supervision be an element of that process? I think that would be appropriate, especially in light of this court's 2008 order, that that is one of the conditions of practice supervisor, and, and that was to help with these trust account issues. And in looking at those, the 2008 decision, there was the supervision, um, but there was also uh, audit of trust accounts. Are you still asking to go back in time to audit trust accounts, or is that... That seems kind of at this point a moot issue, um, and right, and, and I will say that I do not believe that was done because right. everything sort of imploded at that point in time. And then the third one is to be free from violations for a period of three years from the date of the decision. Relating to, relating trust, to trust accounts. accounts. So again, that one seems... Correct. So um, if all we have left is the requirement of a supervising attorney, um, does that, do you still feel it, that there's a hear, reason for a hearing? A reinstatement hearing? I do for the other reasons I addressed. I mean, the education, to the to, to show sufficient evidence of rehabilitation, like dig a little deeper into that. And three, I really do think we kind of, whether it's through your decision today or through a reinstatement hearing, we need to wrap up this 2008 issue. And, and bring some closure to it and how we're going to do that. And I think that can be done through a reinstatement here or it could be done through your opinion. Okay. Any more questions? Thank you, Council. Thank you. We thank you both for your presentation this morning and this afternoon. The court will take this matter under advisement.